Um, so my name is Ty. It's kind of weird because I am Ty. Um, so it's a sick joke my mom made up. So just, just so you guys are aware. Um, so I want to, I'm here to talk to you guys about the product market fit, and I think one of the things that I'm trying to get at by the end of this session is for you guys to walk away thinking differently what, of what a product really is, right? Of what a product really is, especially when it comes to the e-commerce world. So we think, if you guys when really think about products, you think about this as a product. You think about cars as a product. You think about um, this itself as a product that you sell to people. But what I want to get at is for you guys to be able to understand how deep to go when we start thinking about how the product spend is and how it would fit within the market itself, right? So, I wouldn't, I wouldn't presume to say that I am the expert at product market fit, but with my experience and what I've done in the past, I've always focused on this field when it comes to the e-commerce world. So, that being said, um, there is um, one of our, our great scholars in the past, Mark Andreessen, that actually um, give a definition of what a product, um, product is, right, and a product market fit. And the definition is a minimum viable product that addresses and solves a problem or need that exists in the market. Well, if you really think about it, minimum viable product is a really shitty product. Like who, like that, that's really a horrible concept to start with, right? So essentially, even what he's saying is that you enter the market with a product that is the, is the worst that you could do, and then you try to see how far you could advance and build it up. So what I'm trying to, to, to talk to you guys about today is to really understand how do we enter the market with a better concept of a product, and how do we enter the market with the concept of the product that speaks to the customer itself. Um, so, that being said, um, once I well, once we start discussing it, we'll discuss how the product and market fits with um, with the competitors within the market itself. Looking at the market that is out there, um, and understanding how to interface with the customer. Again, you'll see a lot where I keep referencing back to e-commerce because that's all I know, right? So um, I didn't come from any traditional business or anything like that. I, I pretty much entered the e-commerce industry ever since I was 22 years old. Um, and gain and trust the habits of the customers. And, and also walk you guys through the different areas that I have been um, in. Um, so you guys have an understanding of where I get this experience when it comes to the product and how it fits within the market. Um, and then we'll start discussing about the market within Thailand itself. So that being said, um, again, Thai American, um, grew up abroad, I was born in America, um, came back recently to my, my mom is Thai. I worked in the US, Europe, China, and now Southeast Asia. In the US, it was quite different. So I started in the investment banking world, and at the time when I started, it was during the um, time right after the dot-com bubble burst. So you guys know, like in 99, 2000, um, all of these companies in the tech industry in Silicon Valley was going down the drain, right? So I was actually in my, right next to them. I was in San Mateo working within the investment banking world. And my job was really to work with distressed assets. So at the time, I went in and I look at companies and find out why companies are failing. Sometimes we had tech companies that was getting investments coming in by millions and millions of dollars, and they didn't really have a product. They didn't really do anything. So essentially, they just came up with an idea and started getting investments in because everybody's going through the tech craze during the night, man, during the late 90s. Um, so that's what I really did was focus on the distressed assets, merging companies together, um, especially tech companies. One, sometimes you had a product that was very fractured, right? So if you take two companies um, that actually that put them together, they actually provide a really good product that the market needed. But by itself, one company was really, uh, that, uh, did not have the product that was needed for the market itself. So one example was that I worked with a company that was actually a cloud company. So it was called Quick Download a long time ago. So during that time, the cloud was, was even before the concept you know, of Apple iCloud and all these things that, were, that was rolling out now. But before, the reason why the product did not fit with the market was that the dial-up speed was still those old modems that you guys had, right? So how can a cloud really work at that time? So this is what I mean about understanding how the product and market fits together. Because at the time, the market was not ready for that, uh, that technology yet. Um, and then I eventually um, joined a, a, a company, a t-shirt printing company. So um, some guy out of his parents' basement um, contacted me because I helped him set up his company before through my investment banking field. And he was like, hey, you need to join me. It's a really cool industry. So I was like, 
look, you're printing t-shirts. Like, what do I want to do with that? So I eventually left a 400K job a year to join a guy printing t-shirts out of his parents' basement. So we started a company called Carmelo. So it started as a t-shirt printing company. And eventually it rolled into a, one of the largest streetwear industry within, um, within America itself. So the company became valued over a billion dollars before we actually exited and left it. Um, then eventually was recruited to come to Thailand and join, um, join Moxie. So at the time, Moxie was fractured into different companies and we reconciled and turned it all into one company that focused on one thing. Um, so that was another example of the product market then. So that being said, I'm currently with Honest Bee right now. Um, how many of you guys heard of Honest Bee before? OK, good. Um, thank you so much. Um, so um, Honest Bee is, is, a, is a very uh, modern and new take on doing things, right? So if you really think about it, it's, it's, it's one of the prime example of a product market fit. Because the market is still very offline at the time. So what we're doing now is that as a business, we're focusing on marrying the online and offline world. Because the mar that's what the market is needing right now. So yes, eventually in the future, where you would be in America and nobody walks around anymore. Because in America, nobody walks around. That's why e-commerce does so well. And the offline world is, is tanking in America. Um, so nobody walks around and then you just order everything online and it shows up at your door. Um, where in Thailand, it's still very different, right? The market here still walks around. People live their life outdoors um, because apartments here are really small, condos here are really small. Um, so we need to figure out a way to actually marry the two together because that's what the market really needs within Thailand. So that being said, I want to start with, um, with just go walking through so you guys have an understanding of what steps we would go through. So again, this isn't the, the know all and end all. This is really how I've actually approached building out products within the market itself. Um, so, Bef when, even before I came here, um, when we were coming up, coming up with ideas at Carmeloop on like, how we should be approaching it, we actually understood that the streetwear industry was very, very small at the time. Nobody was selling streetwear. Hip-hop was very much like, like TLC. I don't know if you, ever, you guys ever heard of them, like the band TLC, right? So that's what hip-hop was. So a lot of those clothes weren't really sold anywhere. Like you actually had to go find crazy clothes, put them together, and set your own style and stuff like that. And that's what hip-hop really was. So we actually understood that the product that we need to build out was actually a hip-hop brand, um, but being more like a fashion expert on our end. So we, weren't, we didn't want to be a brand ourselves. So again, when we, when we did it, we went through all the different steps to try to understand, and we took an extra step. So one of the extra steps is actually working with marketing to build out more of an ecosystem. So I think that's where we will start diverging more from the textbook definition of product market fit um, based on the experience that I have, is where we actually take an extra step. Because again, building a minimum viable product is not the best thing to enter the market with, right? So you actually have to think of all these concepts and be more conceptual, be more conceptual at your thinking to be able to build it out properly. Um, and then understanding your product, understanding your audience, um, and build it to match. But I think the last part is understanding your audience. That is the hardest part that most companies have. And a lot of times, it requires a lot of iteration to actually really understand, um, especially if you don't have data yet, right? So people like me, I like to be in more of a cutting edge industry. So I get bored really easy. Um, so I started in streetwear because it was new, my streetwear online because it was new. Then I went into, um, into more of like, my, I guess, my traditional e-commerce. And then I got bored with that. So I wanted to focus on women um, because I knew how women think. I wanted to focus on They were one of the most powerful my spenders within even in the world, actually. They're, they're the power behind all the spending, so to speak. So I always wanted to be a little bit more advanced and be a little bit more on the cutting edge. So understanding your audience is one of the hardest things because you, unless you actually are in a traditional business where data is already there for you, you actually have to try it yourself and see what happens. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you would burn up millions of dollars trying to figure out, okay, will this work or will this not work? Um, quite frankly, it's better to do as much research as you can ahead of time um, than, uh, than to actually burn up cash as you're trying to reiterate um, as you go. Um, so that your investors don't kill you um, and then you know, at the end of the year you're kind of screwed. Um, so this is the market itself within Southeast Asia. As I mentioned to you guys, I 
really like the women industry um, a lot more because I do think they are the most powerful spenders within, within Southeast Asia and pr pretty much anywhere else in the world. So that being said, I think a lot of you guys are from insurance, right? So who else is, who's from retail, FMCG retail? Anybody? Okay, so one or two people from FMCG re retail. Um, the, when we do a lot of research um, on the market itself, a lot of it is actually centered around FMCGs because that's what the, that has been the retail industry that has been around the longest, right? Um, and that's actually the retail industry um, that the data is being collected the most. So you have Nielsen that does data collection on them. You have, um, well, n now you have new and upstart uh, startups that are coming up, like Snapcart, uh, that is actually doing data collection on FMCGs. Um, so the, a lot of the data you, you get will be focused on them. The biggest problem there is that it doesn't always resonate with your product, right? So if I'm rolling out, um, I don't know, Tesla, can I rely on the data that is out there? You know what I mean? Can I rely on the data? So when Elon Musk is rolling out Tesla to the market, he can't really rely on the data that's out there because it's such a new concept. It's such a new thing that's out there. So it is very difficult to do, but you have to do um, a market research as much as you can and understand which audience you want to go after. Um, the biggest mistakes that company make is that they go after too many audience at once. So um, one, it will cost you a lot of money to do that. Two, people function differently. So women don't think the same way as men. Um, women over 50, women over 40 don't think the same way as women that's under 20. So you guys have to understand what audience that you guys want to go after. And I think that's where e-commerce gives it a little bit more of a power because it lets you collect a lot of data on customers. So I work, right now I work with, um, with some of our offline partners and they are so surprised at what data that we have. They're like, wow, you could tell that this person is 18 years old, you could tell that this person is this, this, and this. And e-commerce allows you to actually see that. Um, because unlike, uh, unless you want to be intrusive and stand in front of a store and ask the person what's their age and stuff like that, right? Um, it's very difficult to get that data on the offline world. It's very difficult to get that data unless you're actually collecting it for one reason or another. Um, insurance company, I'm assuming, collect data all the time, right? Uh, but the question is, do we use it for anything? Do we use it to advance our agenda, advance our business? Um, where in the e-commerce world, you collect this data to actually you use it to actually build up strategies, to do things that would segment out the customers, focus on different customers, and understand how to, how to market towards them. Um, so again, understanding the market is really, really important as you're building out the product itself. Um, like I said, I like, I like to focus on the women's market. Um, I, when I was at Carmelo, I was selling women dresses. So I was a buyer and I was selling women dresses. One of the, one of the things that I figured out at Carmelo was that women like to see clothes flow. When, when you take photos, you don't want the model to stand there like they're a broken mannequin, right? So you want to blow a fan at them and let the wind blow behind them because they, they want to see really how it would look when they are actually walking down the aisle, walking down um, the sidewalk, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of things that we have to understand when we, when we deal with the different audiences that we're focusing on. Um, men, what we find out, especially in the fashion world, don't buy their stuff themselves. They don't buy it without their girlfriend or their uh, wives know. Their, their girlfriend or their wives are the one that really decide uh, if it's something that they should buy or is it something that they, sh they should not buy. Men in general are not fashionistas. Men in general don't really focus on what kind of clothing that would look good. Um, they, do it to, um, they do it because they want their girlfriends or their wives to look good when they're out and about with their girlfriends or their wives. So we, are finding, we find a lot of different things out in understanding the different audience so we could actually build out the product to match them properly. This here um, gives you guys an understanding of how to analyze the competitors within the market, right? So the reason why I put Honest Bee smack dab in the middle, um, it's my current venture right now. Um, and we're going to be rolling out quite a few things in the near future that will actually impact all different segments of the market. So the reason why I ask is who's in retail, who's in insurance, of course, um, is to try to understand um, where would you be fighting in? So, it's all about, when you talk about competitors, and I know that Paul, the previous segment, was mentioning a lot about um, Amazon coming into the market, right? So Amazon is coming into the market, and they will probably compete with Honest Bee directly. They will probably compete with Happy Fresh, Home Pro, practically everybody directly. So Amazon would also be another company that sits in the middle of this quadrant. The, the reason why that we have to understand the competitive market is that we need to understand how to pivot our product properly. There's going to be things that happen next year or the year after that we have to be prepared for. 
Pivoting product is not that easy. It takes months and months to actually pivot. The reason why you need to know ahead of time is because sometimes you take advantage of it. Sometimes you don't take advantage and you avoid it altogether. So in Southeast Asia, Amazon and Alibaba will be going through an all-out war in the next five years. So when I say all-out war, I mean they will be throwing money in here like crazy. Alibaba doesn't want the fight to come back home to China because that's their home turf, right? America doesn't want the fight, or Amazon don't want the fight to come back to America because that's their home turf. So what they want to do is they will be fighting it out in Southeast Asia. When they fight it out in Southeast Asia, there's going to be casualties here. So I know this region has always been, you know, the home of casualties when it comes to war, but wait until the retail war comes and you, we will see what happens. Um, there's, and this is one of the reasons why um, Honest Bee is structured quite differently because we actually knew these things were going to come out, right? So in a way, we are going to be very similar to Amazon where we do deliveries of goods. We will do deliveries of goods to people. Um, we will do the deliveries of goods to people under the same quality and services. The difference is that we're now going to marry the offline world. The reason why we want to marry to the offline world is because we want our partners to understand. Like, we want TOPS to understand. We want Big C, Tesco to understand that unless there's a coalition built to actually prevent a giant like Amazon and Alibaba from entering the market and destroying us, there's going to be casualties on all fronts. So, and this is one of the, the, I mean, the key initiatives of Honest Bee is that um, as a company, we're a natural coalition already, right? So because we don't do anything ourselves, we don't really sell the product, we don't have the products ourselves. We use our partner's warehouse, we use our partner's stores, we do the deliveries for them, uh, we empower them to go online as much as we can. So, and we have multiple partners that's on there. So naturally, if you're on Honest Bee, you're already part of the coalition. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out ways to prevent Amazon and Alibaba from shooting us by accident. Because they're not going to be aiming for us, they're going to be aiming for each other, but what's going to happen is that we will be the casualty of it. So one of the things that, uh, that I wanted to uh, also talk about is how difficult it is to differentiate yourself within the market, right? So the market is quite, um, it's, the best way of saying it is that a lot of people perceive things differently. So customers would perceive you um, really differently. Um, for instance, Honest Bee entered the market um, five months ago or six months ago. We're surpassing our competitors right now. But what people, I mean, what people think is that we're a grocery delivery company, when we're really not. So we're a convenience company. So we actually do everything. So as we roll out more and more, people will start realizing that we're not just a grocery delivery company. So we now have groceries and food. Um, we have, um, um, we have on-demand logistics. We will be rolling out more things that I can't tell now. But you guys will start seeing us pop up um, left and right. And it's really supposed to be married the online and offline world. Um, and again, it's really designed how we're building out the product for people, right? So that being said, to really differentiate yourself um, is, is one of the di most difficult part, but it's really also about building out the perception of how people are perceiving you. Um, Amazon, people from Amazon launched in, in Singapore about a month ago, and their infrastructure was not enough for the demand. They didn't expect the demand that they were getting, right? So Red Mart sales dropped by half in one day. Like literally, their sales dropped by half in one day. Everybody all went to Amazon. And the reason why is because Amazon has been able to, to differentiate themselves from the, the local players within Asia. So if you really think of Alibaba, you think of Chinese, you think of um, more like discount products that they sell, you think of those kinds of things. Where Amazon, you actually think of the service, right? Because they focus on branding prime a lot. They focus on doing a lot of things that actually differentiate themselves from the market. So when they do start entering, they will actually be seen as much more higher quality, much more um, better at what they do. Um, that being said, it's all about how we're building out the perception of our brand and our product itself. So, and this, this here, I want you guys to think about more than just the product. Like again, product is not just this, right? Product is this. Product is also how it clicks. Product is also the sound when it makes the click. So cars, for instance, BMWs and Mercedes spent millions of dollars studying how the sound of closing a door works, right? Because it sounds, it comes off more premium when the, actually the door makes a certain thud sound when it actually closes. So this is what I mean when I when I, I want you guys to think about going further as you're thinking about product. It's not just trying to sell this thing on the on your on your website or not just trying to sell this thing at your store. It's really like for us, we look at how the the entire experience works. So, and, and I'll walk you guys through my my my, my background and the different companies that I've been with and what we did to actually do that. Um, 
So again, the other thing is that trying to understand, can your product go viral? Some companies come out, they didn't have to do much marketing. Like Uber entered the market um, in America when they first came out, didn't have to do much marketing. People started using Uber apps and started telling their friends because it, it went viral. It was such a new concept. It was such a, 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 an awesome product that when, addresses the need of the market, right? But then we will talk about how they failed trying to enter, not failed, but how they didn't enter as successful as they, as they should be into the Asian market, um, where Grab is now eating their lunch, so to speak. Um, so again, start with your audience. Um, making sure your competitors look worse than you. Um, again, this is a prime example of how Amazon has been beefing up their brand. Um, they, before they entered, they try to build up the hype as much as they, poss as much as they can. They had articles that was rolling out about Prime constantly within Asia. The reason why they did that was because they wanted people to see how premium of a, of a, of a quality of services that they could provide to people. Um, so that way, when people, when they actually roll out, people would jump from Redmart over to Amazon. Um, and quite frankly, it worked for them. When they first launched in Singapore, it took half of them in Redmart's volume within one day. Um, so that's what I mean about shittifying your, your competitors. Um, so it's really trying to get people to perceive you differently um, than before. Um, and then the other thing is, is I wanted to confirm is, or talk about is really the understanding your core competency. So a lot of people, they, especially in the e-commerce world, they don't realize what they're good at. right? So they, what they do is they try to focus on so many different things, and they try to roll, it, roll out the product at once. Um, and then they realize that they're, they're going to war with someone about my, over things that are trivial to them as a company. So for instance, when, am I at, am I, when I was at Moxie, um, I avoided the war with, Am with Lazada, right? So anything that Lazada was doing, I avoided as much as I can. The reason why is because Lazada had more money than me. Lazada was much more stronger than me in a lot of areas. So the way that we were able to do it was that we understood our core was understanding women. Our core was understanding what women wanted. So we actually focus on the, on the content a lot more. So at Moxie, we became more of like a content site that sold products, so to speak. Um, so this is what I mean about understanding really where your core is, so you could actually fight the war that you really need to fight. So again, the question is, what is a product, right? So um, is it really like building a vision? I, I think that that's one thing that, uh, that, uh, that I actually feel that it is. When you build out a product, you, have to, uh, you can't just say, I'm selling water. You want to say, I'm, selling, um, the, I'm, I'm, I'm making people not thirsty anymore. You see what I mean? So that way, it allows you to pivot a lot easier if you ever, ever have to. I could tell you now, 9 out of 10 of you that's building out an e-commerce product will not stick with that product. It, within the next two or three years after you build it out, you will probably pivot somewhere. You will probably move around somewhere and try to focus on the right um, audience that you have. So it's not as easy as, as just saying, I'm selling water to people. Um, so that's what I wanted to get at when, I, when we talk about product market fit. The other thing is understanding what goes into the product itself, right? So for Honest Bee, it's our partners. It's our supply chain. It's everything that goes into it because it all, everything that you do touches the customer. So that itself is, is a product to the customer. Um, and not just the, the physical end product. But if you talk about Unilever or you talk about um, P&G, their product is the product itself, right? So they don't really do anything except for making the product. And then they let the retailers do the selling. They let the um, distributors do the selling for them. So they don't really have to do, uh, deal with all that stuff. So it's really understanding what, uh, what to you is the product uh, that you're trying to sell to people, depending on what you're trying to do. So, but in the tech world, in the interface and user experience is much, much more difficult and much, much more in important. For e-commerce companies, we don't have a chance to interface with the customer at all. So unlike a store where you walk through the aisle and you go and someone's asking, hey, can I help you? Or you walk through and you're checking out and someone upsells you something. In the e-commerce world, you don't have that because it's very, there's no people involved. So what, we, what I do in, in, that, in that situation is that I focus on customer service a lot because that is the biggest thing when it comes to e-commerce. You have to focus on customer service. It's your only chance that you're interfacing with the customer. Everything else, like UX and all that stuff, yes, you're interfacing with the customer, but it's a very static way of interfacing with the customer. Every customer will get that same experience no matter what with, within the e-commerce world. That, but if they have a problem with their order or they're doing something or they mess up on their code, really how you're reacting to the customer and the customer service that you're providing for them is the key point that you're able to touch the customer. 
So take advantage of it. And I think that's where, where the interface and the user experience is really, really important as people are building out their product. Um, I know that you guys aren't like not all Americans or whatever, but um, in America, Zappos, for instance, right? So uh, how, how many people have heard of Zappos? So Zappos is a shoe company, started as a shoe company, became really big, two, three billion dollars. Um, Tony's actually a good friend of mine, um, and he asked me to drop out of school to join him, and I did it. So just so you guys know, I could have been a billionaire if I actually joined him, um, but I didn't. And, but Zappos' product is not the shoes itself. Zappos' product is not, um, is not the products that they sell on the site. Their product is actually customer service. So they give you peace of mind. When you order from them, you could, do, you could return an item um, within a year. You have an entire year to return an item for, for them. And they give you a return slip, very easy to use. Um, whenever you call them and talk to the customer, uh, or talk to them and talk to the customer service rep, they talk to you like they're your friend. And they become your, your, the associate assigned to you constantly. So whenever you reach out to them again, it's the same person that will talk to you. So essentially, you're t that person becomes the face of Zappos for you. And that's the person that you connect with. So imagine, for them, that's their product. The product that they built out for the customer is the customer service itself. So different companies have different things, even though they, you would think that your, your perception of them is that, oh, they sell shoes or they sell clothing online. Um, when in actuality, they actually sell the customer service. Clothing and shoes is just a, a part of it that they're supposed to uh, give to you. Um, so again, advanced services and after sales. Um, brand and value proposition is also really important. This is a struggle that I have uh, a lot with, uh, with a lot of my uh, companies because it does take a long time to build up um, a brand and value proposition. Um, Honest B right now is going through um, the, our strategy of painting the town yellow. So we have umbrellas going up everywhere. Um, we have riders that are garbed out in yellow. We have a marigold, so it's um, uh, timed perfectly with, um, with our Dear King's um, uh, funeral. So we have marigolds going out to everyone. So there's things that we're doing to actually try to brand ourselves and provide that value proposition to people. The difficult part of, uh, of showing your, your product's value is making your customer understand what it is, right? So for us, customers still think that we sell groceries. They think that that's what we do. Um, the good thing for us is that we actually entice customers to order um, from Honest Bee within the first hour because we want them to see our value proposition. So when you order from us within the first hour, you, orders will be delivered with you, right, to you uh, within an hour. Ninety Two, I think, 92% of our customers are actually doing that right now. If their first order is always for the first hour. They want to see if we could really do it. So I think a lot of them think that we can't do it, so they actually test us. So they order, they might order and they might do it for the first hour. After that, I think only 2% actually still order for the next hour from, from, from subsequent orders that they're ordering. Because at first, they just wanted to see if the value proposition is really there for them. Once they actually get that concept and the brand is there for them, they don't really need to test you anymore. They know it's there, even though they're not using that value proposition. It's just a brand that you built for them, right? It's just something that you built for them, and now they have an understanding, oh, wow, Honest Bee could do deliveries within an hour. So even, um, even though they're not using it, they still know that, and that's a value proposition that we gave them. Um, eventually, as we roll out more, you guys will see that, we're, that there's different value propositions for different segments of our customers. So the other thing is also is the intangibles. I think a lot of people overlook this. Um, some of the intangibles are like, quality and consistency, right? So how many, time, how many people have gone to supermarkets here and didn't realize that it's actually the same chain? I, I've done this with, with some of our brands, right? So some of our partners, you walk into one, one branch, it looks horrible. It's dirty, it's, you know, it doesn't look as, as nice as the other ones, but then you walk into another one and it looks like Whole Foods. It looks like Trader Joe's out of America. So like the, the brand is not consistent all the time and I think that's one of the biggest problems that people have when it, when it comes to understanding how to make your brand as, a cons as consistent as possible. Because not all customers will actually interface with your best store. Not all customers will interface with your best customer service. So if you're, for instance, you're selling insurance, right? One customer service might be really good at what they do. One customer service might not be that good at what they do. Now, if you have SOPs in place that makes everything consistent across the board, then the customer will get the same experience <coughs> over and over again. Because you don't want the customer to get the first time experience from that horrible customer service or that horrible agent um, that then they will actually identify you like that for the rest of their life. You know what I mean? So those customers you just lost forever. So I think this is where consistency and quality is really, really important. 
um, and understanding the psychological psychology and habits of customers too. So as we talk about more um, my background and my experience, we'll talk about how I understand the psychology of my customer and how I understand the habits. Um, a lot of times habits have to be formed. We as, we as retailers, we as um, the business actually have to build the habits for the customer. So for instance, if you guys look at magazines like Vogue magazine, or you look at, um, I don't know, um, USA Today or something like that, right? A lot of the fashion that's in there is not set by the editor. It's not set by anybody, but it's set by the buyers of the fashion company. So the buyers are the one that's actually set the future trends of the fashion of the world. So they're the one that actually thinks, will this sell? And how do I make this a, a cool trend to come into the market? Um, so that's how the, the, the buyers are setting. So they actually start building out habits. Once they actually set it, they build out the habits, and now the customers are constantly trying to go back to them and understand, okay, is this the best look for me? Is this something that I'm trying to focus on? Um, is Paisley in, in this year? Is Saffron in this year? We don't really know, but that's, what, but that's how the buyers are building up habits, right? They're making you buy the magazines over and over again. I think the last uh, I, I looked at statistics shows that 60% of people buy magazines just to understand what are people wearing. What are people buying? What are, pe what are the fashion and the trends that are out there? So these are the habits that buyers actually build out. Um, so when I was a buyer, I actually paid magazines to put my stuff in there. So just so you guys are aware, magazines don't do that for free, right? Like somebody has to pay them to put that stuff in there. So we actually pay to actually build out a lookbook within a magazine. Um, we pay bloggers to talk about things, right? So this is about us setting the trends and building out the habits for the customers itself. Um, so it really plays on the psychology of a customer. A lot of them think that they're actually getting this from somewhere else, but it's actually the retailer that's building it out for you. It's all about building out the ecosystem. So going back to e-commerce, um, because this is where I came from and grew up with, um, e-commerce products are quite different um, from, from what people think. So of course there's the end product. There's a product that the customer gets when they order from you. There's a product that the customer, or the experience that the customer gets when they order from you. So that means that's there. But what goes into it is, is a lot of different things. So a lot of people think that, hey, I'm just going to set up a website, um, and people's going to come to the website. I'm going to buy maybe some basic AdWords and push some things on social media, and people will come to the website um, and buy my product from me. That's really not how it works. So just so you guys are aware of all the stuff that goes into an e-commerce product, right? Um, so First is understanding, within the market, are they mobile or are they desktop? Different demographics, so different avenues. Mobile, mobile customers function totally different than desktop customers. Desktop customers love to browse. They seem to have a lot more time on their hand. Their um, time on site is much more higher than, than mobile customers. Mobile customers' time on site is much more lower because they're constantly being distracted, going back and forth. So these are the things that we have to understand as we're building out the product, right? Um, especially the e-commerce product. The other stuff is understanding the UX to match, and this is where I focus on the women's um, uh, demographic a lot. Women's are browsers, so when they go on the site, even though they don't need um, like a scarf, they would just click into it and be like, oh, what kind of scarf do they have this, in this year? Um, even if they don't need a dress, they'll still click into it just to see, where men are totally different. Men, 90% uses a keyword search. They would just go in, type whatever they need. So I think this personality or this personality trait comes from the offline world, right? If you send your husband or your father or somebody to the mall to buy something, he goes straight to that store, buy it, pick it up, and walk right out. Doesn't ever shop. When you send a woman, and not to belittle women or anything, but it's just the habits of, of women, they would walk. They would actually check, oh, I'm here anyways. Let me check to see if Zara has anything. Oh, I'm here anyways. Let me check if the new makeup line is out for, for, um, McKay, for, for Mary Kay. So there's so many things that, that, uh, that differentiate the different uh, segments out. And you have to build your, your e-commerce product to match them, um, so understand how they're shopping. Um, at Moxie, we focus on, on, we focus on content a lot, because women are big consumer of content. When, when, I was selling, when I was selling women's dresses and fashion at Carmelo, they, we, so, so I had this yellow sundress, right? So just an example. This yellow sundress, really nice. Um, at first, it didn't really sell. So what I did was I made it flow. So I went down and I blew a fan on them and had my photographer redo it. 
Then it started selling. So I started selling really well. And then I was like, okay, how do I make it even better? How do I make it go viral? So because we actually, we, this was actually a dress that I brought on board. It was a style that I wanted. Um, I put it into the magazines. I built out lookbooks on it, and I wanted to go viral. So what I did was I found a picture of um, Angelina Jolie wearing something very, very similar. I put it up, I built a content around it, so women would be consuming the content. They would read about Angelina Jolie with her 1,900 kids that she had, um, and all these things, right? So then they understand, okay, Angelina Jolie wore this and she looked really good. Sales skyrocketed overnight. Like, it literally went, when, when I say skyrocketed, I'm talking about one, my, my warehouse literally took that dress or that skew, brought it out to the front and wouldn't even bring it back. They just left it at the packing station because it was selling so, I mean, so fast. So this is what I mean about understanding how the different audience are functioning um, as you're building out the product for them. Um, the other thing is also understanding the application and how, it, uh, how does it take. Um, some people function differently with the applications itself. Um, some people, like I said, use keywords. Some people use browsings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, reaching your audience is really important too. Um, how to do it, and I think this is more on the realm of marketing. So again, this goes more further. Um, than you think of a typical product, right? You have to think of like the, the market and stuff like that and how to reach the customer as much as you can. Um, this is the most expensive part, iteration, study and reiterate. Um, a lot of times you don't really know um, what you're doing. You don't really know, um, especially if you're in a new industry like me currently in Honest Bee now, we don't have no one to learn from. So we're kind of, it's such a new thing that we're doing. It's such a new concept that we're doing. So we kind of just have to iterate and keep doing it and trial by error as much as we can. Um, so that being said, the key thing is understand the market and the audience and how it fits together. Um, understanding who's the real spender. Like I told you guys, um, women are the real spender when it comes to retail. They're the one that buys even the clothes for men. They're the one that actually help make the decision. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I always keep pivoting over to women as a demographic and I keep going after them um, and selling my product and building a product around them um, rather than trying to build it around men. When they're only about 20% of the um, buying power. Um, understanding the good fit, spending power, and I think this is where it's really important, um, is the spending power itself. Um, some, some people within the market don't have the spending power. So when you're trying to sell things, so for instance, 10 years ago in Thailand, um, people didn't um, want to buy e-commerce, uh, buy products off of the e-commerce platform because they wanted the convenience, right? They wanted it because they, they can't get hold of that product. This is why the gray market was so big in Thailand 10 years ago. People were going to Jailing Market to buy makeup that they can't get anywhere else because it's not here yet. So this is the power of, of understanding um, the, the real spenders and what they really want within the market. Nowadays, if you look at e-commerce, the customers want the convenience. They don't, the, all the products are already here. You can get a hold of it anywhere. If that's no longer a, a problem within Thailand. But the biggest problem now is understanding and, and getting the customer to understand the convenience within your product itself. So I think these are the key things that you guys have to ask yourselves. Um, and also, are they ready for you? The, and, and like I told you, back to the co company that I worked with, um, with that, that failed, um, not just the people weren't ready for them, the internet wasn't ready for them. You know? So having a cloud at the time when your modem is still making screeching noises when you're trying to dial in is not the best time to do it. So these are the different concepts that, that we have to look at to see if they want to, um, if the product is really ready for the market. <coughs> So again, this one I'm going to skip over really fast. So it's really repeating the same thing. But the idea here is, also, is just understanding um, your audience and building your product based on your audience itself. Don't build it and expect them to come. That you're not Jesus, you're not God. That's not how it works. So the idea is understanding, OK, what does the audience want? And how do I build out this product for, for them to actually uh, want to come and buy from me? Um, the angle approach is really, really important in this situation. Um, Understanding what are you known for, and this is where it comes out to building trust, right? So every company that I, that I start up in the world of e-commerce, I start with branding first for people to know me. Two, I start with, um, uh, with building out trust. What are you known for? So Amazon's trust is you go to Amazon or you go to eBay, for instance, and you know that you could always find something at eBay. eBay sells the weirdest things. You could go on eBay and you want, they, they, I think they got in trouble for selling um, like a shrunken head like just a year ago. So like they sell the weirdest thing on eBay. So that's what they're known for, right? So that's what you trust that they have. So you go to eBay to just to check what products are out there. But you would go to um, like, like, like Uber or Grab because Uber and Grab actually is known for transportation. 
they're trustworthy, their people went through background checks, and all these other things. So this is what I mean about understanding what you're known for and making sure your product fits in with it. Um, and how to gain the trust depending on what you really do. Um, so this here is the trust and habits of the customers. Customer acquis acquisition alone does not help. So you could acquire the customers all you want, um, but there's a lot of ways of acquiring them, but sometimes it costs you money to acquire them, and they don't really stay, right? So this is what happens in Asia five years ago. A lot of companies use discounts to acquire customers. And then the company fail because those customers would only stay with you if you provide that discount again. But if you keep providing discounts over and over again, your company is not viable. It's not a viable product. And this is where we actually have to think about, is, is your product a viable product? If you have to give discounts all the time to get the customers to buy, it's not a viable product. So again, this goes back to understanding what the product really is. Um, making your brand desirable. Um, I focus on this a lot. Branding is really important for me. Um, ma making sure that people understand what it is. So I like bright colors. When I did, come on, so just so, so we could jump for sake of time. When I did a Karma Loop, I split everything out, right? So Karma Loop first started as one brand, one company, um, selling t-shirts. So we realized it was very strong, very, um, very masculine. So in order for us to attract the stronger, the, the more feminine women, because we did have women at Karma Loop, but they were all like butch lesbians. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to attract the, the, the more, I guess, the more feminine ones. So we split out Miss Kale, different color scheme, different brand, different way of shopping. And so it's a separate website for them. Um, Casbo was the same thing. Casbo was really understanding and, and finding out um, products that uh, was not really there, um, products that was up and coming. So we did this because the brand needed it. The, uh, the different audience that we had actually wanted to see different things. Um, the other thing, too, is that we wanted to be an expert at what we do. So we built a company called Hypebeast. Um, I'm not sure if you guys heard of Hypebeast, but they're actually one of the largest content sites within America now. So we built it out, we pivoted out, we spun it out, but it's really for us to be able to be the expert at what we do. So this is how Karma Loop be actually became the top brand when it comes to streetwear retail. So then I came to Thailand, and what I found out, very similar to Karma Loop, was that, but the opposite way. Um, our customer were all the same. So my audience was all the same. Even though I had four or five different brands out there, it was all the same way. So what I realized that was that I was spending a lot of money. I was spending a lot of money on the marketing side. So what we did was we zipped everything up into one, um, and then we focused it on the women's demographic, because those were our biggest, uh, biggest demographic. Um, we rebranded it, added content, added collection system, because women wanted to see suggestions on how to buy things. Um, they don't want to just go buy a couch, but they wanted to see what it looked like in the room. You know? So we actually understood how the, the, the audience wanted, and we built our product properly um, when it comes to their e-commerce products. And now with Honest Bee um, is quite different. So I mean, we'll talk about the competitors too here. So Honest Bee, I, when I first met, was given this, uh, this opportunity, um, I was, my, it took him six months to explain to me the vision, right? Because at first I was like, I didn't want to be a grocery store. That's not my, my background. My background was building out brands and products. So he was like, you have full reign over this. You could, um, the, the strategy is going to be localized. You do whatever you need to within Thailand. So when I first took over or when I first started the company, I focused on understanding what my audience wanted. So I knew that only 3% of, you know, of, Thai, um, of Thai audience are online or shopping online. Those 3%, 90% of them are actually more affluent. They're the ones that have the money to spend, right? They're the one that's actually willing to, to understand, or they're the one that understand that time is worth money. And that's what we were selling. Our product was selling the product of time is worth money to people. So what we did was we went after brands that are much more higher end. We went after Villa Market, V Provide, Q Fresh, and all those things. And now our audience started coming in. So because the product was built out properly, the audience came in without us really spending too much money on marketing. So this is what I mean about um, us being only five months old, and we already surpassed most of our competitors within the market. Um, I know because e-commerce is very incestuous. It's, everybody knows each other. Everybody talks. Um, so we're already surpassing our competitors because we built the product out properly from the beginning. Um, we focus on the right people. Um, there are, and then you talk about your competitors, right? So Zalora, I think everybody knows about Zalora. Like how, how is, was their brand aligned? It really was. Um, however, the, the brand itself was really difficult to pronounce for Thais um, because we don't use R's. So 
there's like a lot of things that 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 really uh, was kind of on the fence with them. Um, but then this is why now they're rebranded to Luxy, right? So um, so Central took over and rebranded them to Luxy. Um, the product to the audience was not there for um, for Zalora because they didn't control the products. The problem with them was that Central already had such a monopoly on the brands. Central, so they weren't able to get any of the brands. So this is where Zalora had to pivot. So they pivot over to a private label. So Zalora started launching Ezra and all these other things, and it actually did really well. But in the beginning, it did not do well because their product was was trying to sell fashion to ties. Ties are very label driven. So I mean, so unless you actually I mean, have some of the major labels like Chanel and um, things like that, it's really difficult for you to tap into the Thai market. And that was hard for Zalora in the beginning. Um, but everything else they were really good at, um, targeting the audience. And I think this is their, just their rocket background, right? Their, um, their rocket background that understood how to build up an e-commerce company. So they were really good at that. Um, Happy Fresh, on the other hand, um, again, full disclosure, my, my competitor, so I might be really biased. Um, so their branding is aligned. You look at it and you actually think my groceries, right? Uh, in actuality, I actually think their branding might be more aligned than, than Honest Bee, um, but that's another story. Um, but their product and the audience and how they build trust and whether the market and stuff is ready for them is not really aligned. So for instance, they came into the market, they signed Big C and Tesco. The demographic of Big C and Tesco aren't the online shoppers. Those aren't the ones that are online shopping. The demographic that, uh, that was online shopping was Villa Market, was Tops, was Gourmet, um, so, the reason, so the reason why they actually started doing better was because they actually signed Gourmet afterwards. So they first came in thinking the masses was what they had to go after, but that's not the ones that are willing to uh, wait in, uh, th those aren't the ones that are willing to pay for the time, right? So I, I, if, you, if you talk to like a taxi driver, they would literally I'm gonna sit, I'm gonna sit I'm gonna in one place and just wait three hours to pick up a customer, rather than taking up a customer now and dropping off wherever they want to and then come back and just make that extra money. They'd rather just sit there because they don't understand that time is worth money. <coughs> so I think that's where their audience was failing. Um, the other stuff, I think I gave Grab and Uber really good high praises. Um, the only difference between uh, Uber and Grab is that Uber didn't really, went after the premium market um, within Thailand, where Grab went after the mass market. And that's why Grab is actually doing really well um, because they, not, not only the premium needs, uh, needs, needs to use transportation, right? The mass market needs to use the transportation too. Um, and if you talk to a lot of Thais, they just feel very standoffish <coughs> to use Uber. They just think Uber is too like, much for them, even though it's the same price. I, I mean, it, actually, Uber is actually cheaper than Grab most of the time. Um, and then, of course, you have Convi. Um, that was my previous my competitor at Moxie. And their brand was not really aligned, but their product was really aligned. They were the one that played in the gray market. They were the one that pioneered the gray market, brought in products that didn't exist here. They brought in the naked brand when it comes to makeup, right? So they were the one who first brought them in. So they were the one who understood what the audience really wanted and brought in the product that really matched them. So that being said, I think in conclusion, just so you guys are aware, the idea that I wanted to just come across is for you guys to take a step further, just this thinking of the product itself. So go further and say, okay, what is the real product? Is that the product itself, like you know, the sound of the clicking, um, the way that the customer would be holding it, that itself is, in a, pro is a product, right? Um, how you guys are reaching the customer itself is in a product. So think further. So go further. Um, start bringing in um, uh, marketing. Start thinking of the ecosystem that would be built out around your product, around your, your, your store. Um, and then that itself would be the bigger product that you're trying to sell to the customer. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody have questions? Um, just to go back a little bit to your first mover disadvantage, mm -hmm. um, is that more because of the fact that things are happening so quick now that we can't rest on the laurels of being the first mover and we have to actively build a brand using all social media? Or what is it? It, just, it feels slightly like we might be there. We might be doing the right things, but we're not immune to these big companies coming in and just taking all market share just because they have a bigger name. Correct. And, and what you find is that these big companies are doing that. Mm. So for, there is a big thing when it comes to first mover disadvantage, right? It's, it's not like in the old days where, um, where like Montgomery, uh, I, I shouldn't use Montgomery word because you guys don't know, um, where like building out Walmart is really, really, exp uh, really difficult to build out, right? So the first person in that neighborhood to have a big store actually wins because people will think of Walmart, they'll go to Walmart all the time. In the world of e-commerce, that's not the case anymore. 
the, the world of e-commerce, you might be the first one in there, but a big giant could just swoop in behind you, having all the knowledge that, they, that you already built out, um, doing the same thing that you're doing, and literally taking all of your market share quite easily. Because there's no, there's no setup cost anymore in the world of e-commerce. So the reason why I mentioned my first mover disadvantage is that um, it's, it will cost you a lot of money um, if you don't really, if you don't have a product that is one patented, that have defensibility in place, meaning that nobody really knows. That's why Honest B is really, really careful with our technology. So we actually, anybody who touches the technology, anybody at senior level, actually sign like five different contracts to make sure nobody meant that technology doesn't escape. So um, it's really, really difficult to under uh, to to defend yourself if you're the first one in there. Um, Apple does this a lot, right? So. Apple wait for someone to do something, and then they come in and they do it way better than them. They come in and they build a better product than them. Um, I think uh, we see that with Alibaba and Amazon. They don't enter fresh markets. So technically, Alibaba and Amazon should have been here first. They shouldn't have let Lazada build all these things out, right? But then what they figured is, hey, let the smaller company burn up as much cash as they can, figuring out what to do with this market, building out the expertise, um, and quite frankly, uh, as whatever you want to say about uh, Lazada, They've actually built out the market for us. Like even me entering, it was much easier for me to enter the market in Thailand because one, I already had people that have e-commerce experience. Two, customers were already starting to get used to e-commerce, right? Um, so if you were the first to enter, you had to build up the trust. You had to get people to understand that, hey, give me money now, and the product will show up at your, your desk. I'm not scamming you um, like most of what, uh, what people would think. So I think there's a big uh, move, uh, first mover disadvantage in the world of e-commerce um, because there's no setup cost. Uh, how you say you know, your product properly before going to market? I heard about that in wisdom. How because of e-commerce lowering the cost of entry or cost of setup, um, you should just go in and then learn. So what do you think about those? I have a different um, perspective on that, right? So. Um, I think going back to what Paul said earlier in the previous session, if you have the money, do it. The, the problem is that it's going to burn up a lot of cash. I think that's one thing that people don't realize is that people think, oh, e-commerce can't be expensive. You just create a website that costs you $5,000, you know, and then you put up all your products on the website. But it actually burns up a lot of cash because not only, not only does e-commerce executives and e-commerce workers get paid 30% higher than the average, and the average employees within Thailand, but you also are spending money on acquiring customers. So are you willing to go in um, with a minimum viable product um, that doesn't do everything that you need them to do and hoping that you will be the one, the first person to get the market and then end up spending all of this cash to do it. So Lazada did it. So it, granted, it, it worked out for them. I'm, I'm not sure if it really did because I think their sale price was not as even as high as how much they burned, but the, there's a different perspective on it, right? So where if you have a company like, um, like for instance, um, companies like um, Grab and Uber, right? Um, they, they first entered the market, but they weren't really the first movers. The first movers were, um, were the taxi system. The first movers were the other system. They just came in with an app that actually made it a lot easier. So the question that you really have to ask, and by the way, they do burn up hundreds of millions of dollars on a monthly basis. So the question that you have to ask is, do you have the money to try to come in with a minimum viable product? Or do you want to wait for your product to be there first before you come in? So um, for instance, <coughs> Honest B, um, I could have entered the market without COD. I could have entered the market without, um, without a capacity system. I could have entered the market with a lot of things that was not ready, right? So they said, do you want to enter the market with this? So I said, no, I'm just going to wait. So I, was, I, I actually joined um, Honest B in 2000, at my first, my, the beginning of 2016. I didn't launch a product until my, five months ago because I waited until the product was ready to go live because I didn't want them to enter. Because if you enter the market without COD, it's a killer in Thailand. Uh, we're, we're seeing 60, 70%, even though our customers are very affluent, and uh, we see 60, 70% is still using COD. So these are the things that you actually have to ask yourself. Yes, I could have done it. I could have spent a lot more on marketing to acquire different customers, right? But it would cost me more to do that. Um, but is that the best idea to do it or not? So it's, it's really depending on how much cash you have to burn up. Anyone else? Okay, thank you so much, Kaupunakap.